mercy on you. Amen. Well, sisters, uh, I'd like to request our Hafiz school principal, Hafiz Mujahidul Islam, to come to the microphone and introduce our speaker today. It's my honor and welcome, Brother Hafiz Mujahidul Islam. <laughs> This is one of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Last week we have uh, Sheikh Hassan who was here and was talking about uh, the current issue which is we're facing uh, with our uh, young generation and, uh, because uh, it's very sad news for, uh, for us and for our community. Some of our uh, children, some of our young generation, those who are uh, even start disliking Islam. You know? So we arranged a program uh, last week. Sheikh Hassan was talking about all these issues. Alhamdulillah, most of the brothers was uh, benefited from his talk. And we have uh, another Sheikh. He is uh, Sheikh Muhammad bin Adam, uh, from uh, also from the United Kingdom, inshallah. So we will hear from him. Uh, the topic has given to him the prophetic empathy. Inshallah, I will request to our Sheikh to speak about uh, this topic, inshallah, and explain to uh, our next generation, especially. Most of them, I see lovely faces, lovely faces. Our young generations are here. <coughs> so, inshallah, I will request the Sheikh to speak something specially for them, inshallah. The Sheikh is one of our traditions. Before the introduction of the speakers, this has become a tradition. But our elders, our Akabirin, our Asatiza, including his Asatiza, the person who have learned the ilm from him, is one of the one of the great mufti. If this is three mufti in this world, then he is one of them is Mufti Taqi Uthmani. Saudi Arab, they have offered him to become the Ra'is, the president of the president of uh, Sharia Council of Ulama of Saudi Arabia. But he denied. He denied. He has written so many books. I am requesting that my brothers and sisters, those who are here, especially if you read his some books, and I think he is the only one person in the world alive who have very speciality in Islamic finance and Islamic banking. If you read his books, you can find in English, you can write in, in, in Urdu too. Uh, some of the brothers here who bought a house here, uh, who purchased house and uh, get loan from Guidance Residence here, which is one of the only Islamic finances here. Some of you know that, the Guidance Residence here, here. He is the chairman of this Guidance Residence in the United States. He is living in Pakistan. But he is the chairman of this guidance residential. They took fatawa, they took a suggestion from him. I was present myself one time, about around 2006, yeah, 2006 was month of November. I was in Makkah, 2006. And there was an Islamic conference on, on finance. I was there. Some of my brothers were there. SubhanAllah, the Sheikh today, the Imam Haram, the Imam of the Kaaba, Imam of Medina was there. But his topic was Islamic finance of the representative from Pakistan, Mufti Taqi Usmani, representative from uh, uh, India was uh, uh, Sayyid Arshad Al Madani, representative from uh, Bangladesh, Mufti Abdul Malik different part of the world. So when they announced his name, I was so surprised. When they announced his name to come and speak in front of the audience, in front of the Aima al Haram. Subhanallah, Yubi Hamdi. 11 Aima al Haram, 9 Aima of Masjid al Nawabi, everybody, including the government of, of Makkah, they stood up in the respect of this person. That was Musa Taqi Usmani. He got knowledge from this him. So may Allah SWT give him to finish Allah, and this is mercy for us. We get a lot of help from the United Kingdom, from ulama, from Atufat, and from other Islamic sources. Inshallah, I will request our uh, Sheikh to please uh, 
speak on this topic in the cooperative empathy and benefit us, inshallah. Jazakallah So one thing is that, so they used to always uh, used to ignore that introduction. As a, that was my um, main thing to tell you that. They always used to ignore the introduction, too many introduction they used, they don't like. It. So without any introduction, if you um, hear him properly, I would request all of you to turn off your cell phone. Please sit and listen carefully, then you will get benefited. And listen with the uh, intention of Amal, then you will get benefited. Is that Alhamdulillah, <coughs> اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا يا رب العالمين اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه وبعد Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh First of all, it is a honor, a pleasure to be here in this masjid, Jamaica Muslim Center, which is not in Jamaica, that's another country, which is in South America, but in Queens. This is my third visit to New York. Last year I came at the same time and the year before at the same time. Now I know all the areas, Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, Manhattan, I know the areas now because of going this way, this way, so Alhamdulillah. It's a great honor for me to be here. I am thankful to the masjid, the committee, the organization, the, the brother who invited me, and also our Imam and our Sheikh here. May Allah reward everybody and all of you for coming today and taking out your precious time on a Sunday evening to talk about a very important topic. And I want to SubhanAllah, some, some amazing things that uh, our Shaykh mentioned about one of my teachers. We call him Shaykh al-Islam, Mufti Taqi Uthmani, Hafizahullah. He's actually coming to the United Kingdom tomorrow. I am landing and he's landing at the same time and I'm really looking forward to going back away from America here. Yeah. So, I want to tie some things to him because he, meant he was mentioned. That wasn't my intention. The topic is Prophetic em empathy. A lot of people don't say empathy. What is empathy? Prophetic <coughs> empathy means many different things about Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa His character, his shama'il, his khuluq, his rahma, his mercy, his compassion. And I'm going to talk about this in different aspects of his life, with his family, with his wife, with his children, with his fellow Muslims, with his enemies, with animals. And I'm going to talk about all of this. But if you summarize all of these characteristics and qualities, when we say empathy, the rahma, the compassion, everything of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you want to summarize, if someone said, oh Muslim, you're a Muslim, your messenger is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Summarize in one word, one, one word summarize who he was. We know he's a prophet, so you don't have to mention that. But in his character, he was a prophet of Allah, Rasul of Allah, Nabi of Allah, the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the last messenger, Khatamul Nabiyyin. But in terms of his character, his akhlaq, his khuluq, his characteristics, summarize, give us the khulasa, the summary, summarize his character in one word. Anyone? He was a little mother. Mercy. 
He was mercy, yes. He was rahmatullil alameen. That's also part of this. Sorry? Walk in Quran. Walk Quran. Kana khuluquhu al Quran. All of these things, of course, are there. We can't say that. I'm not saying you can't say that. You can say Rahma. He said, Innama ana rahmatul muhdad. I am a mercy that is given to you. But all of this goes to one amazing characteristic, and that is his highest characteristic. That is the, his highest maqam, the greatest maqam that Allah has given him. Imagine this is Rasulullah, Imam al Muslimin, the Amir al Mu'mineen, the leader of mankind. When he was, when in his time, he was the Amir, the, the head of the government. He is a father, he is a husband, he is the nurse of the Prophet, he's got the whole Ummah concern of the whole ummah on his mind he has concern of everybody he, he he has concern for the whole of humanity the most busy person that you can think and imagine on planet earth no sheikh no imam no scholar no nabi can even come close to him no sahabi nobody no great celebrity imam can come close to his not even to the footsteps that he walks on not even equal to the soil that is under his feet this is the greatest of mankind, Sayyidul Bashar. But his highest maqam was that he was Abd, the slave of Allah. That's what made him big. He was Ubudiyya, slavehood. You know, seriously, we are so far away from, I mean, I say we, all of us, everybody included. I don't want to say specifically these people and that people, but all of us as a Muslim ummah. In our way of living, we are so distant and so far away from the way, the standard, the living of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How was he? Imagine, this is Rasulullah. He could have had everything. The, how much did, did he eat and how much do we eat? How much do we eat and how much did he eat? How is his living standard? How was our living standard? Allah said to him, angel came, we can make muhad mountain into gold. He chose poverty. He chose slavehood. Actually, Allah said to him, do you want to be a prophet and an and a abd or do you want to be a prophet and a king? Because there were prophets before who were kings as well. Sulaiman alayhi salam was a king as well as a prophet. Angel Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasalam and said, this is a choice. Which one do you want to choose? And then gave the gesture to him that cho choose the, the Ubudiyya and that fitted with his characteristics, with his nature. And he says, Innama ana abd. He says, ana, I am a slave. Akulu kama yakulun abd. I eat like a slave eats. Ajlisu kama yajlisun abd. I sit like a slave sits. When he would sit, this is how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would sit. The way he sat, ultimate level of ubudiyya and humility and humbleness. Never arrogant. The way, between the shamail, how would he walk? He's like walking, as lowering his head. Nowadays, somebody learns two ayat of the Quran, they, they, they think the sheikh of the world. Somebody knows how to recite good Quran with voice, the, the sheikh of the time. Someone's a sheikh, a mufti, whoever. Any small something, someone goes in Jama'at Tabligh, becomes Amir, and that's it, I am like ruling the world. Anything, people have this ego issue, which is far distant, sorry to be frank, distant away from the character of the Messenger Sallallahu What made him big was his humility. He never thought nothing of himself. You know, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, in the beginning, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't even have a special place to sit on. He would sit in the middle of the companions and talk. And then the Sahaba had to tell him, Oh Rasulullah, when someone comes, they don't know who Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is. They're asking, like somebody came, an Arabi came and he said, Who is the messenger amongst you? Who is he? Then they would say, Hada rajulul abyadul muttaqib. This one, fair complexion, leaning against the pillar. That's Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was difficult for people to recognize him. So then upon, upon the its insistence, the israr of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa had a small member and pulpit made for him so that he could teach. Because so that people when they come, they listen to him and it's not, not inconvenient. He disliked people to stand up for him. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum used to stand up. 
there's rules, the fiqh of standing up for someone. There's, it's permissible. Uh, someone who dislikes, someone who likes that people stand up for him, it's haram to stand up for that person. Someone who's not like that, it is permissible. There's, a, there's lots of rules about this, and books have been written. In, Imam Nawawi has a whole this booklet on this topic, Hukmul Qiyam Lin Nas. But the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he disliked people. The, when he would come, Sahaba used to stand up. He said, "Don't stand up for me. I don't want you to stand up for me." Now the Sahaba companions, radiyallahu anhum, they would die for the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They would give their lives for him. Imagine one of the Sahabi says that when he would come, we had to literally put knives on our hearts not to stand up. We want to stand up. This is our most beloved person ever. But because he said no, his convenience, his raha, his sukoon, his peace is in the fact that we don't stand. He doesn't like it. So we, oh, we really want to stand up, but they wouldn't stand up. He sits like a slave sits. He eats like a slave eats. In the Shama'a, you read that when he would walk, no two people used to walk behind him. No entourage. Today, a celebrity comes and 400 people before him and 400 behind him. Not literally, but people on the right and people on the left. It's like Kiraman and Katibin and I don't know what's happening and how many people and coming in cars and visiting in cars and all of these things. This is what I'm saying and I'm really serious about this because this is so far distant away from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's way of life. And I'm not just talking about anybody who studies Islam. Every aspect, like I said, someone, basic deen, someone knows how to do a small talk, a few words, went in the path of Allah a few times, learned a few things here and there, and that's it. That's it. Everybody thinks like, I'm the great person. Now, you know, the ego, this is a human ego, kibbah. Pride, arrogance, importance. Everyone has this animalistic trait, and that's why Tazkiya is one of the most important aspects of our deen, working on the heart. And Allah makes big people big because of the humility. There's a hadith where the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man tawada'a lillahi rafa'ahu Allah. Whoever is humble for the sake of Allah, who is modest, humility, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevates that person. All these people who are great in the sight of Allah as well as in the sight of the people, they always have humility and humbleness. Tawadu' is a fard ayn. Its humility is absolutely necessary, obligatory upon every Muslim. We have to work on our hearts. Remove pride, remove arrogance, remove showing off, remove ostentation. Be a humble, gentle, abd, slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is an obligation upon every Muslim. And this is why he was mentioning my teacher and just one quality of my teacher, and I don't want to be talking about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of course. But as an example, the successes of his, the inheritance of his, and there's so many people. The Sahaba had this quality after that, and the Salaf, and the Tabi'oon, and many others. But people that we see with our eyes, and this is someone I've seen very, very closely, like many, many, many times. I've spent not too much time, but as much as I could. Someone who's on top of the world, I mean, these are real scholars. You might see him walking on Jamaica Street or whatever the street is called, and you won't even know who this person is. There's people, they've seen him doing tawaf of Ka'bah, like walking like, like an old uncle. Nobody knows this is the Shaykh al-Islam. Nobody recognizes him. He sits, when he sits outside down to eat, the way he's eating as well, like, you know, really humble person. People don't recognize him. You go, there's no one, he never travels with 500 khadim and khuddam and 200 murids and 600 million other entourages. Never. He travels alone with his wife. Your greatest khadim is your wife. You know, the greatest murid and khadim are people like to have millions of people. The greatest person. People don't have relationship with their wives and then they just spend time in the whole world outside. Travel with your spouse just as a, you're a normal human being according to Allah's slavehood, abdiyya. That's why the greatest maqam, and sorry, I, I don't know if I'm being too frank or not, Allah Adam, but this is something in my heart that I've talked about a, a few times, but it's really important that we bring this into our ummah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why did I say the greatest maqam is being abd, you know the isra and mi'raj. Subhanalladhi asra bi abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-harami ila al-masjid al-aqsa alladhi barakna hawlahu linuriyahu min ayatina. <laughs> that verse in Surah Bani Israel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about one of the greatest, one of the greatest episodes or incidents in the history of humanity. 
definitely in the seerah of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But if you look in the history of humanity, probably no other great occurrence you can think of, maybe other other than the birth itself of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam that happened in history. And then this isra and mi'raj. Allah subhanahu wa taala talks about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. His isra and mi'raj. This is such an important part of his seerah, his life. When he mentioned this, how did he describe it? Subhanallah asra. Glory be to the one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Asra bi abdihi. Who took by night, he never said his Rasul, bi Rasulihi, no, bi Nabihi, no, bi, bi whatever, whatever, bi Shaykh, bi Imam, bi Rakhatam in Nabiheen, the greatest person. At this occasion, Allah chose to use the word Abd. He took his slave because this is the highest maqam, even the greatest maqam for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was being a slave to Allah. And that's what we need to become. Being a slave to Allah, having ubudiyya and having humility and being a khadim of deen. Empathy means khidmah. Asra bi abdika misrish of Laylam min al Masjid al Haram ila al Masjid al Aqsa. He took him by night from Masjid al Haram to Masjid al Aqsa. Anyone traveled been away last year to Jerusalem? You should try if you have if you can and if you have space and time and money, you should go and visit the third haram. It's very important. Makkah is the first haram. The masjid of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina al Munawwara is the second haram. Third haram is al Masjid al Aqsa, al Quds, the whole area. I'm sure some of you have been and traveled, and if you haven't, then please take time out and go. It's, it's really, really important um, to visit those places. Barakna hawlahu. Allah has blessed that whole land. So, this was it. And I will mention one other thing that's come to my mind. When Allah said, Bi abdihi, also, if this is a side point, the word abd refers to a human being who, who is physical. We live in a time right now that people are being affected too much by modernism and by reformism. In England as well, we've got this great fitna. We, you know, the small, small other ikhtilaf issues. I tell the students, forget all those small, small, you pray this way or pray that way and this moon and that moon. And who cares? These are small issues. We live with differences of opinion. This is part of our deen, adab of ikhtilaf. I had a talk today on that. These are small, small issues. Our deen is greater than, you know, fighting and arguing with moon and here and Amin and Salah and this and this group. And who cares about these issues? These are small, small issues. There's greater issues in the Ummah right now. Greater issues. There's people who are leaving Islam going to atheism. There are people who are not openly leaving Islam, but they are denying and, and disagreeing with mainstream established laws of Islam that nobody challenged from the time of the Messenger until today, 1430 years, maybe a few here and there, one Mu'tazila or somebody in the past. Established issues. Two, three weeks ago, one brother said to me that I believe that there's no real angels and there's no shaitan. They're just like positive and negative vibes. There's no real makhluk. Shaitan is not someone that Allah created. It's just, you know, when you have bad influence or bad, that's shaitan. Like everyone's a shaitan. If whoever gives you a bad influence, there's no real belief. And he says, this is how I believe. And in the Quran, and this dalil, and this that, and you know, some, someone told me something. And angels as well, they're not real. Some people are denying that Isa alayhi salam is going to return. Again, mainstream established law since the time of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this as well. Because you see, we are very influenced with what's politically correct. Why should we be influenced with people around us and what they think? Islam is a logical religion without a doubt. Islam makes sense. There is hikmah, there is wisdom behind every law of Islam. There's books written on this topic. Why you do wudu and the way you do wudu, there's wisdom. Why you do ghusl and the way you do it, there's hikmah, there's benefits, personal, societal, and communal benefits. Every rule of Islam is a hikmah. Learn about them. But our acceptance is not based on us understanding. There's wisdom, but do we have brains to understand the wisdom or not? That's another question. 
There's wisdom that we might not have brains. And everyone's intellect and reason is different. One person is according to whose reason? So right now, this is like Islamic sense of how did Allah Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam go on a burakh and go all the way in the middle of the night and came back. There's Muslims, Allah Alam, if you can call them Muslims, I, I don't want to start, we don't like to play the kufr game because that's also very, people, but people are denying that Isra and Miraj actually took place. Or oh, it just happened, it was just a vision. Why was there a massive, like, in the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he was called Siddiq because someone said he is claiming that in the middle of the night, if you believe he's Rasulullah, then, you know, there's nothing far-fetched from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You think, oh, but how can he go and come back? And it's not possible logically. Of course it's not possible logically. This is not logic. This is not reason. This is submission. This is wahi, revelation. This is when you, your brain stops working. Logically, how can you prove this Jannah? Logically, how can you prove this Jahannam? Logically, not everything in the world, there has to be some sort of submission in life. There has to be some sort of submission. And then logic, your brain, you might not accept it. So I was just saying here, the word Abd, that's my off topic, but I'm going back to my topic. Subhanallah al-Asra bi abdihi. He took his slave physically by his body, by his ruh, but with his soul, with his body, in soul, in spirit, in mind, it wasn't just a dream. He wasn't just sleeping next to Kaaba and he saw a dream. Then what's the big deal between him and us? We dream everything. You know, you, you dream you're on the other side of the world every day. Half of you are in Bangladesh in the middle of the night and then come back, you know, return. Alhamdulillah, illadhi ahyana ba'dama amatana. Oh Allah, thank you. I was in Dhaka and Shilet in the middle of the night and I've come back. And one person earned $2.44 million in the middle of the night. And someone's gone on the sun and the moon and come back. And what's the big deal? Then is it the biggest incident? It's not the biggest incident. Dreams are dreams. Dreams are small issues. Why make dreams? Like, it's nothing. People dream about everything. This person dreamed that he got married and he had 15 children and everything and in the morning he woke up, where are my children? No. So it's not a dream. It was physical. Mi'raj ascension. Allah took him on the Al-Buraq and took him to the heavens and he met the prophets. Abd. Abd means a physical person. So anyway, going back to this, that Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his greatest quality, his greatest quality is ubudiyah, slavehood. He chose to be the slave of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. This was his greatest quality. From all the characteristics, from all the characteristics, his humility, his tawadu, the way he would walk, the way he would talk, the way he would show empathy to people, the way he would be the way he would converse with people, if you read the Shama'il of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he would speak to somebody, he would give them full attention. Someone comes to speak to you, he would turn. He wouldn't just like, oh yeah, yeah, go, 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 go. Give them full attention. This is because he, he considers the other person to be important. And this is why this takes us to the, this this other quality or these two qualities which are very important, which every single Muslim must have. One is having rahmah, mercy in the heart for the whole of the creation of Allah. And number two, having this quality of serving khidmah, serving the whole of the creation of Allah. These two things are very important. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi somebody said, you know, or one or two of you said, Rahmatulil Alameen, and this is part, the main title is Ubudiyah, but under that is Rahmatulil Alameen. He actually said, Innama ana Rahmatul Muhdat. Indeed, I am a mercy that is gifted to you. This is a hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What did he say? I am a mercy gifted to you. What does that mean? Who is a giver of the gift? <coughs> Allah is the giver of the gift. You know when someone gives something to someone? You have three parties. The giver of the gift, the receiver of the gift, and the gift itself. Who gave the gift? Allah. Who is taking the gift? Us. And the gift is Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said this in the hadith. Innama ana rahmatul muhdat. The word muhdat is from the word hadiyah, hibah. 
I am Rahma that is gifted to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me, gave me as a gift to you. And that's why Allah said, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ There's a hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari and elsewhere. This hadith is known as what we call Hadith al-Musalsal bil awaliyya Some of the scholars and students will know. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith, الرَّاحِمُونَ يَرْحَمُهُمُ الرَّحْمَنُ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى يَرْحَمُوا مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ يَرْحَمْكُمْ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاءِ وَيَرْحَمُوكُمْ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاءِ You know what Hadith al-Musalsa bin Awaliya means? This is also another part of our great Islamic tradition. You know, our scholars of Hadith from the earlier times, they were so particular in, in preserving everything about the Hadith and the Sunnah and the Seerah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba and the Tadi'un. But we have, the, we have this tradition of what we call that some things the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did, whilst he was saying the hadith, the next person did the same thing, the third person did the same thing, and he carried on until today. So like, musalsal means continuation. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to one sahabi, his name is Mu'ad bin Jabal, radiallahu anhu, he said, Ya Mu'ad, O Mu'ad, inni uhibbuka, indeed I love you. Faqul dubura kulli salat. Therefore, because of this love for you, I'm giving you advice. Say after every salah, make this dua. Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Mu'ad radiallahu anhu heard this hadith. When he was teaching his student, he said to him, I heard the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say this. And then he said to his student, Inni uhibbuka. Indeed, I love you. So say after every salah, this dua. When his student was teaching his student, He's related the hadith, and then he said, Indeed, I have love for you, so therefore say after every salah, this dua. Then the next person, then the next person. Until today, we have shuyukh. This There's about 45 people. It's a continuation. This is called hadith al-musalsal bil-hub. Hadith with a continuation with every person saying, I love you. Along with the hadith. You have hadith al-musalsal بالقبض على اللحية. The Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم once said a hadith, and whilst he was saying it, after the hadith, he put his hand on his beard and he said, "Amen to بالقدر خيره وشره." When the Sahabi related the hadith to his student, he put his hand on his beard as well and he said, "Amen to بالقدر خيره وشره." And the next person, next person, every person till today we have shiur. People go and get this, receive this ijaz. It's a barakah, it's blessings, but benefit is like you get connected to a chain. It's not knowledge itself, but there's blessings in it. Uh, and then you have so many different types of musal salat. There's 112 or more books have been written on this topic where there's different types of musal salat. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa once he put his hand on his head and he said something. Companion, when he said this hadith to his student, he put his hand on his head. Everybody, sometimes it goes all the way to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sometimes it goes to like the Sahabi or the Tabi'i, sometimes three quarters of the chain. Everyone's doing this, putting their hands on the head and saying the hadith. There's so many different practices that are carried out. What time do we have to finish by? So, different types of musal salat. Yes? Putting the hand on the head, holding the beard, saying something, standing up. There's one called hadith al-musalsal bil musataha. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, oh, until wherever the chain went to, he shook the hand. So right now the teacher, the shaykh, will relate the hadith to you. And then you go to the shaykh and you say, Safihni bil gafil ladhi safahta biha shaykhak. Shaykh, my hands with the hands with which you shook the hands of your shaykh. And that person said that to him all the way to Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu who said, I shook the hands of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fama masistu, fama masistu. I never touched anything. Alian bin kafir Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His hand was the most tender and the soft of hands. So you have these Musa Salat. There's actually even some, you know, quite latif ones, like um, intriguing ones. I won't say funny ones, but it doesn't go all the way to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But some Imam like this. Imam Shafi'i asked Imam Malik once, how old are you? Imam Malik said, Aqbir ala shanik, mind your business. When Imam Shafi'i was teaching, his student said, Ustad, what's your age? He said, Aqbir ala shanik, mind your own business. Fa'inni sami'tu Malik an yaqood, because I heard my teacher Malik say, Aqbir ala shanik, mind your own business when I asked him. 
And then when Imam Shafi student was teaching his student, they asked him, oh, Sheikh Ustad, what's your age? He said, mind your own business, because I heard my teacher Shafi say that when his teacher, Imam Malik, when he asked, he said, mind your own business. Till today, there's a Sheikh in Medina and Munawara today. I haven't received this hijab, but one of my friends, he went to see him and he said, Oh, Sheikh, what's your age? He said, mind your own business, all the way to Imam Malik, mind your own business. <laughs> this is, it's not a hadith, but it's to Imam Malik. There's so many different things like this, which is amazing that the Muslim Ummah preserved these kind of things. So one of these Musal Salat is what we call Hadith al Musalsal Bil Awaliya. When the student learns hadith from his teacher. This is the first hadith that is taught before any hadith. After Quran, if you study hadith, the first hadith that is taught, it's called hadith, which is continued with the hadith being the first that is taught. Awaliyah, it's awal hadith, before any hadith. This, this is a famous one. Every teacher, every shaykh of hadith, and every, whichever part of the world, whether subcontinent, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, or whether in the Arab world, in Mecca, Medina, Syria, Jordan, Yemen, Morocco, Egypt, wherever, Israel, anywhere, this is unanimously the whole world. Every shaykh of hadith, they know this is called hadith al musalsal bil awaliya, and this goes all the way back to, it doesn't go all the way back to the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but it goes back to Sufyan ibn Uyayna. Rahimahullah ta'ala, who was who taught his student as the first hadith. What is this first hadith? Imagine. First lesson being given to the student. The hadith Ar Rahimun Yarhamu Rahmanu Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. The Rahimun, the people who have Rahma in their heart, the ones who have mercy in their hearts. The Rahman Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has mercy on them. Yirhamu man fil ard, yirhamkum man fil sama. If you have mercy on the creation of Allah, if you have mercy on the people of the earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have mercy on you. This is the first hadith that is being taught to Muslims. That if you want this slavehood, you see, these are the two. The summary is this. I want some of you, us to take something with us. Like it was mentioned, it's for practice. The end, I'll summarize, and I might ask some questions, and I might have a test and exam, so, you know, don't run away, you know, because you might think that, oh, it's going to be too many questions. But the summary is this, basically, that we need to have ubudiyah. How do we have ubudiyah? Number one, have mercy in the heart, and number two, which I'm going to talk about, which is be a khadim. So I'm just talking about these two aspects of ubudiyah. Ubudiyah and then two things. Rahma and khidma. Okay, so I started with ubudiyah. Now I've gone to... Rahma. Then I'll come to Khidma and then I'll conclude. This Rahma, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, compassion. We have to create this in our hearts. This compassion is something we, some people are born with and some people are not born with. Some are born with much and some are born with less. Not just Rahma, Imam Al-Ghazali Rahimahullah said in his book that good character, you're either born with it or you have to acquire it. And those who are not born with it, they can't say it's not fair because this is a taqseem of Allah. Allah gives different things to different people. Some people are born mad and crazy and angry. They need anger management treatment. They're just born very angry. And someone's born, like we say in England, cool as a cucumber. Do you have that phrase here? No. no. Okay, we have the cool, calm, collected. Just nothing happens, just so calm. Some people are just born naturally. Now the one who is born with Anger can't say this is not fair. If I get angry and if I punch someone, then that's not fair because Allah created. No, no, no. This is, this is your test. This is your way to enter Jannah. Let's see if you can work on your anger and work on it and do sabr and patience and fight your nafs and fight your soul. This is your test. Yes, this other friend of yours, he doesn't have this test. But in another part of life, he might have a test that you don't have a test. His, his sexual desire and lust is extreme to the top of you know, the whatever level, and you don't have that. So for him to stay away from zina, from lustful sins, is very, very difficult. For you, it's a bit easy, you know, it's easy. You, you don't have that kind of desire. Everyone, there's a taqseem of Allah. So good character as well. Imam al-Ghazali says, good character, akhlaq, you're either born with it, or you have to acquire it. If you're not born with it, we have to work on it. Rahmah, mercy, if someone's born. Some people are generally very, very merciful. It's in their character. They're just really, really loving, caring. They just have, they, you know, they see, they hear someone, you know, got shaheed somewhere or someone in, 
you know, Burma or somewhere something happened and suddenly they just shed tears and they'll cry and they can't eat. They just have very soft hearts. And some of us, or like someone like me with a harsh heart, it's like you can see sometimes someone's dead on the middle of the road and we just drive by. There was a YouTube clip somewhere that this person got run, got run over by a car and like he was nearly dying and there were about hundred, I don't know, hundred, but so many people just walked out. Okay, dying, okay, let's go, we're too busy on the iPhone somewhere. Then finally, after about 10 minutes, somebody actually wanted to see that what's happened. The one with mercy in his heart, if you see someone on the middle of the road that they, they what, the car has broken down, a Muslim would stop the car. We actually, I remember, we did, I talked about this somewhere in America or somewhere, I don't know, did you were with me or something, I don't know who was with me last year or the year before, or I don't know which part of America, but I know it's in America. Now, I spoke about this topic, not this topic, but this part, and I mentioned in my talk that a good Muslim is someone that if you see someone stranded, Muslim or non-Muslim, you don't just drive by. You stop, ask, everything okay? I know we live in a time where people have all these, you know, they can make phone calls and uh, they can get emergency help. Okay, if you think most likely they're on the phone, you don't have to stop. But if you think this person genuinely is in need, like in, in the middle of the night, and they might, they're struggling or they're looking for someone to help them, a good Muslim will stop. I mentioned that in my talk, and then after the talk, I think we were going somewhere. I think it was New York or Chicago, I can't remember where. But we were going somewhere, and we saw a car was stranded. It was like, you know, on, on top of um, uh, grass, or there was some mud, and it was driving, driving, the tire kept going round and round. And it was me and another couple of brothers from here. I said, look, this is Allah saying, what you say, practice. Let's see if you practice. So Allah is giving us the opportunity to practice. So we came out and we pushed his car and we helped him a bit. Uh, and alhamdulillah, he was happy and then his car moved. This is what a Muslim does. Rahmah in the heart, mercy in the heart. Even with animals. Sometimes we are gentle by nature, but if we're not, then we have to crave this. The Messenger Sallallahu was so merciful that he could not even see an animal. There was one person, a Sahabi, who was sat on his animal, horse or camel, and just sitting and talking to somebody else. The Messenger Sallallahu looked at him and he said, What are you doing? Why are you inconveniencing, harming this creation of Allah? You would have to give hisab and account for this on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. If you need to have a 10 minute conversation, get off the animal. Let's go and see in our subcontinent countries or the Arab world or the Eastern countries, people you know, hit the animals as though they're like, they have no soul. They, they, they are on the donkey, on the horse, and hitting and hitting. Go to India, Bangladesh, Pakistan. Animals, like we think they have nothing, no soul. Then we think, who are these animal rights activists who want to become vegetarians? Because they see all of this. Treating animals well is a farad ayn. We pray Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, but we don't treat animals, no benefit. Inna Allah katab al ihsana ala kulli shay. Hadith of Al Bukhari. Faida qataltum fa ahsinu al qitla. Waida dabahtum fa ahsinu dibha. When you kill animals, when you slaughter even that, make sure you do it well. There was one companion, he was slaughtering one animal in front of another animal. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Don't slaughter, don't do the bah of one animal in front of the other animal. You've turidu and tamutaha mawtatayn. He said, Do you want to give it two deaths? It's already dead by looking at you killing, slaughtering the other animal. We don't have this in our hearts. You know, if, you, if we have this, you can literally see. Have you ever seen, I've been to a slaughterhouse. Many, I've been to many slaughterhouses, but once in England, we went to a slaughterhouse just to see how chicken are slaughtered. They, all of them are coming, you know, in line. You, if, if we have a small amount of like concern or perception or a bit of heart, you can easily see. You know, I was looking at those animals, those chicken faces. Honestly, these chicken of Allah, these creation of Allah, they were frightened, you see the face, imagine all of us, we are human beings, we all hanged here, one by one, de, 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 de. head chopped off, head chopped off, chopped. <laughs> third one's gone, next one's gone, I'm going, they also have soul and ruh, just imagine if we were in that line, where would our hearts be, that doesn't mean it's haram to slaughter, Islam allows it because insan is ashrafu al-makhluqat, 
But Islam has put so many laws about animal treatment. Don't sharpen the knife in front of the animal. Don't kill one animal in front of another animal. Don't pull the animal. Look after the animal. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in one hadith, اِتَّقُوا اللَّهَ فِي هَذِهِ الْبَهَائِمَ الْمُعْجَمَةِ Fear Allah regarding these mu'ajam. These uh, animals are not able to speak. Ittaqullah. Fear Allah regarding these animals that are not able to speak. Just because they can't say anything. They can't tell you, oh, don't come and slaughter me or don't kill me or don't treat me. Don't pull me. Like pull a human being and say, don't pull me. The animal will just say, mm, that's it. Allah, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said what? Fear Allah. You will be questioned on Yom Al-Qiyamah the way you drag the animal. Alhamdulillah, in the Western countries, people are a bit more, inshallah, civilized. But let's go to our countries back like, home. Oh, they think animals, what are they? They're just nothing. And in some places, even human beings are nothing. They treat human beings like animals. Well, animals should be treated really, really well. Forget animals, even other human beings. Because we don't have this rahmah, this compassion, this mercy in the heart. This is what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, full of mercy. If we want the mercy of Allah, we need to show mercy to others. مَن لَا يَرْحَمْ لَا يُرْحَمْ This is a hadith. There was once somebody who, uh, next to them, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once kissed his grandson, Hassan al Hussein radiallahu anhu. There was somebody sat next to him. He said, I have ten of these, but but I don't kiss any of these. Another one said in another time that we don't kiss, we see you kissing your children, we don't kiss our children. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man la yarham, la yurham. The one who doesn't show compassion will not be shown compassion. In another riwayah, when somebody said this, he said, Awa amlik an naz'allahu rahmata min qalbik. It's not my fault. What can I do if Allah has taken away compassion and rahmah from your heart? That's your problem. We have rahmah. He would kiss his children. This is a sunnah of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm sure you guys have this sunnah. If you have small children, kiss them. Kiss them on the forehead. Once somebody came to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, I have a harsh heart. I'm very aggressive. I get very angry. Give me some remedy or a tip. How shall I become soft-hearted? He said, one of the ways of becoming soft-hearted is Place your hands always on the heads of the yatim, the orphans. Look at orphans, four-year-olds, five-year-olds. This is the remedy that the Messenger وسلم, mentioned to remove shiddatul qalb, harshness in the heart. So even with animals, treating animals, the Messenger وسلم, was very particular. The second part of this rahmah is khidmah. Sorry, the second part of this ubudiyah is khidmah. Khidmah, serving humanity. This is an amazing maqam. An amazing quality. One of the shuyukh, one of the, actually the shaykh of my teacher, Mr. Uthmani, mentions in one of his books that if you want the greatest, the greatest <coughs> rank, you want to, or the greatest profession, yeah, the profession, the best profession in life is the profession of khidmah. Be a khadi. This is a profession, every other profession in the world, nowadays people want to be leaders, they want to be amirs, they want to be chairman, they want to be head, they want to be president, they want to be prime minister, they want to be this, everyone, politics, vote for me, that person's bad, vote for me, I'm the best president, I'm the best prime minister. The whole democratic system is based on it's only me and I'm the best and it's all about ego. Put other people down, put yourself up. That goes against the whole Islamic concept of saying I'm nothing and everyone else is something. The Islamic concept is, I am nothing. This one's better than me. This one's better than me. I am nothing. We don't have, we, we consider other people. One of the shaykhs said that I consider every human being, Muslim and non-Muslim, to be better than me. Muslim to be better than me now, and non-Muslim to be better than me potentially. Halal ma'alam. Who knows how I will end with Iman or not? And who knows how he will end? Never don't look down upon anybody. You know, we do, like I was saying in the beginning, we do a bit of Islam and we just start looking down. This is, oh, kafir, or this one, look at him, he drinks alcohol. Who knows this alcoholic person will enter Jannah before us? You know, when we are giving service, when we are even um, doing khidmah, when we are advising, we don't advise 
because we are better. And inshallah, I hope I'm not thinking I'm better than you. I'm worse than all of you, and I need this advice myself. But when we're advising as well, advising, it's not because what? The person thinks he is better. The prophets never thought that. The Sahaba never thought that. They thought they are khadim. I'll give you an example. You know what the example is? Imagine a king employs you to teach his son some English. Yeah? Eight-year-old child. The king's child. The prince. You are the teacher of the... He's hired you. He's paying you a lot of money. You have to go to the palace of the king or the queen or the president or whatever he is or she is. And you have to teach the prince whatever. Teach him some swimming skills or English or whatever. This is a potential king. Whilst you're teaching, you might have to even be a bit angry sometimes. If you're a ustad, you might have to be a bit angry as well. Because it's for his benefit. You might have to say, look, no, no, this is not the way. Look, you can't, you have to do this. Because this is what the king wants from you so that his son learns what he wants him to learn. But for one moment, do you think you are better than the prince? Never. You think, you know what, I'm just teaching. After about 10 years, hope he even remembers me when he becomes a king. I don't know, I might be somewhere else. Hopefully I might come. Do you remember when you were a child king, I taught you swimming? Maybe you might say, oh, okay, okay, all right, just give him something. For not even one moment you think you are better. A ustad, a teacher, a sheikh, an imam, a whoever, anyone in the world or outside the world. Uh, sorry, in the worldly matters or Islamic matters. Whatever, in any situation, the person must think he is a khadim. The one who is advising is like the prince. The whole of the makhluk, creation of Allah are the princes of Allah. We don't believe in sons of God, of course, but I'm saying this is the creation of Allah. This is actually a hadith. But the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, um, he said, Al-khalqu iyalullah fa'ahabbu al-khalqi ila Allahi man ahsana ila iyalihi. The whole of the creation belongs to Allah. That's why the most beloved to Allah is the one who is good to his creation. You know, if I make something, if someone's good to my children, I like that person. If you be nice to my children, I like that person. The whole creation is Allah's creation. Allah loves His creation. So when we love the creation of Allah, Allah loves us. Oh, He is being nice to my creation. Never consider yourself or ourselves to be better than anybody. If someone is sinful, we have hatred for kufr, not the kafir. We have hatred, dislike for sin, for, for the sin, but not the sinful person. This is a principle of Islam based on many evidences of the Quran and Sunnah. We don't hate the sinner, no matter how sinful the person is. We actually think he could possibly most likely enter Jannah much before me. Never have nafra and hate or dislike for even a kafir. Yes, we dislike kufr, without a doubt, but not kafir. We dislike sin, but not the sinner. We dislike stealing, but not the stealer. We dislike alcohol drinking, but not the alcoholic. They need compassion, they need mercy when you, when you talk to them. We need to tell them that you are much better than me. I am just, you know, giving you some advice, but you are better than me. So this khidmah, I was saying, this sheikh was saying that every profession, and I'm ending in three minutes, every profession on planet earth, every profession, being head of stage, every profession, there's problems. You know what the problems are? People fight for it. People are jealous. When you take that profession, people, there's competition. There's competition, number one. There's jealousy, number two. Number three, when you get that profession, there's so many people want to take you away from that profession. Number four, you get enemies as well. All sorts of problems. There's only one profession in the world, the best profession in which there's no competition in which nobody's going to be jealous, in which nobody wants to take you away. You can stay every other profession, you get, what? <coughs> Expelled, or what do you call that? You'll be, sorry, fired. Hired and fired, every profession. <coughs> but there's one profession, nobody can fire you. No jealousy, nobody's vying for it. No, there's no competition. What is that profession? The profession of khidmah. Become a khadim. 
a servant, serve people, khadim, khidma. This is an amazing rank. Have rahmah in the heart, have mercy, compassion in the heart. And then become the khadim of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These two things together makes a person a slave, a abd, abudiyya, which was the greatest characteristic of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. May Allah make us people of compassion, may Allah make us people of khidmah, and may Allah make us true slaves and true abd, and make us close to him and give us a good life in this world, and make us successful in the next life. Wa qul khawdi wa alayhi wa sallam. Jazakallah. Thank you. 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 Thank Three things he said. If you take these three things, there will be no problem in the life. One is Abudiyat, one is Rahmah, and one is Khidmah. Service and mercy for everyone, and Abudiyat, the slavery of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I just want to mention one thing. One of uh, uh, our brothers, beloved brother, Shaheed, Junaid Jamshid, Rahmatullahi alayhi, who passed away last year, or two years ago, I think. I remember one of his uh, uh, Qasida, what is it called, Qasida? Elahi, Elahi tere chokot me aya hu. Ayrizdo nadamat saath laya hu. Ya Allah, I come to your door. I come to your door as a slave of you. Remember my brothers and sisters. No matter how much knowledge you have, no matter how intelligent you are, no matter how much professional you are, no matter how much logic you have in your mind, no matter how smart you are, but remember one thing, you cannot go close to Allah, you cannot be a forgiven one sin by your intelligence, your profession, your education, your any, anything. Allah loves Adamat. Allah loves abudiyah. Allah loves slavery. When you become slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, raise your hands to us, Allah. Become real slave of Allah. <coughs> only nadamat, only abudiyat, abudiyat can make forgiven your sin by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. And only abudiyat can enter you in the jannah, not your logic. Logically, you cannot do it, my brothers and sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to act upon whatever you say.